Good afternoon, bon appétit. I hope uh, the presentation is going to be uh, palatable. Um, it's, always be, it's always a bit difficult to have a presentation after lunch, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep it sprightly, I hope. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about Netafim, uh, which is the company that I, uh, that I work for. Um, and uh, Nati Barak, uh, who's with me today, will also speak a little bit about the examples of what we're doing with Netafim, our technology, our innovation, and, uh, and so forth. Um, just a, a little bit about myself. I'm general counsel of the company, and you can ask yourself why is a corporate lawyer speaking to you about uh, water technology, which is, which is a, bit, uh, a bit unusual. Um, so l let me tell you this. I, I've been you know, in, in boardrooms and behind closed doors all of my professional life. I've moved to Netafim seven years ago, and I've never, never looked back since. The company is, first of all, extremely interesting in the fact that we do business everywhere. And on any given day, you can have deals and interactions with people from around the globe, literally from Ethiopia to Australia to Brazil on any day. So that's one thing. And the other, the other thing about Netafim, which, which, you, which will come up in the presentation, and you'll see it right now, is the fact that it's, it's good for the soul. It's good for the heart. And, and having business, which is, which is also good for, your, for our hearts, I think is something that is, that is commendable. So the, the, the title of the presentation today is Beyond, Beyond Politics, Technology, Innovation in the Water and, 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 the, uh, and the Water and Food Nexus. I think it's, it's, it's a good title. I would probably, you know, probably embellish it a little bit and say that the drip irrigation technology and the know-how around it really transcend a lot of the borders, uh, both geopolitical but also men mentality-wise that are ingrained in a large portion of our world. Uh, drip irrigation at its core runs a counter to thousands or millennia of sensibilities about how to farm, how to irrigate, what, what, are, good, uh, what are good agricultural practices, and the need to educate people the need to educate governments about the use of drip irrigation and the know-how around it is basically what we're trying to do and what we're trying to transcend. So a little bit about Netafim. Netafim sprang up, as you, as you heard a little bit before, sprang up in the Israeli desert, the Negev, in a small town, small kibbutz named Chatzirim. Uh, Nati, by the way, is a proud member of kibbutz Chatzirim. I am not. And just so you know, since Netafim is a, is a kibbutz company, I am referred to as an alien because I'm not a kibbutz member, um, but uh, it's 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 an interesting it's an interesting mentality for a commercial company to be a, kib a kibbutz company. So, uh, when Chatzirim uh, you know was founded, it was basically an agricultural town. It was it was uh, founded on you know cultivating the land around uh, Chatzirim, and uh, due to water shortages and salinity in the water, they ran into problems. So they thought about a solution which would be both an industry alongside agriculture, but also helping out the agricultural part of the, uh, of, uh, the kibbutz. And then they stumbled upon an Israeli inventor by the name of Sim Chablas, who had been the chief engineer for the Israeli uh, National Water Conveyance System. And he had, and there's a nice story about it, I won't, I won't uh, bore you with the story, but he had stumbled upon this technology and together they formed basically a joint venture and they started producing what would be uh, Netafim's principal technology, which is drip irrigation technology, and we'll go in, into details about that in, in a moment. Uh, so that started in 1965. The results in Chatzirim were spectacular, so much so that, in fact, the kibbutz was thinking about keeping it secret, just keeping it for itself and not uh, deploying it uh, elsewhere. But eventually, sensibilities uh, over overturned that, and uh, they decided to market it in Israel. Uh, they were very successful. The company was very successful in marketing in Israel. And what, uh, what basically happened, and you'll see that as well, is that net Israel became basically a proving ground for drip irrigation technology. So 70% now of Israeli agriculture is using drip irrigation in one form or another to irrigate or cultivate land. And once that was proven, then the, the company could turn its eyes outside of Israel and start exporting the technology, which we're doing today very successfully. Um, we're, we consider ourselves an ag-to-ag -ag business because our roots are in agriculture. What we're trying to do is not sell the drippers. I don't know if any of you have seen drippers. I thought about bringing them today, but they're so small, they would probably be lost upon you. They're this small plastic device. There are no there's, no, uh, there's no IT in it. There's not a circuit board. There's nothing in it except hydraulic principles that make water emit from a pipe at a certain output. That's basically the invention. Of course, there's a lot of 
There's a lot of know-how around that. There's a lot of IP embedded in that, but it, it, it's basically a small emitter. Oh, you have it there. It's, again, it's too small to see from the audience, but if you, if you go there, you'll see, you'll see what, what, a, what a dripper is. So what, what Netafim always set out to do is not only sell the plastic devices, the pipes that have the emitters inside them, but also impart knowledge, impart good practices on our consumers so that they know how to best use the drippers that we're selling them. And that's one of the things that I would hope separate us from the rest of the pack, and there is a pack, but uh, th these are one of our core beliefs, and that sprang up from the DNA of the company, which is basically a, an agricultural community. We are now uh, the, the global leader in drip and micro-irrigation solutions. Um, we sell our products in over 100 countries and territories around the world. And if you'll see this map, you'll see where we're based. Uh, these are subsidiaries and manufacturing plants. We have about 27 subsidiaries. As general counsel, I, I have a hard time keeping track of them, you know, closing and opening, but uh, it, never mind, that's part of my job. And uh, close to 13 plants, uh, sorry, six, 16 in total, 13 outside of Israel. So we have plants in the U.S., Mexico, Chile, Peru, uh, two in Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, Holland, Spain, two in India because it's a burgeoning market, and, and one in Australia. And, and these really reflect, you know, where we put our plants really reflect where the market is going. So you want to have a plant that is producing pipes, the dripper lines that we're selling, near the market. It doesn't make sense to sell a, dri a, a dripper line, which is basically a hollow tube, and send it miles away because you're basically transshipping 99% air. So what you see basically is where the demand is and where we need to supply demand locally. That's, that's the raison d'etre of this global presence. Uh, in 2013, we received the uh, Stockholm Industry Water Award, and um, we, we consider it, I don't know how many of you have come across this award, but we consider it the sort of the Nobel Prize of our industry, and we were commended for our pioneering spirit in our presence, and uh, it was a, a major event for Netafim. Let me tell you a little bit about you know, water and, secu and food security. And I, I, again, you probably know all this and you've heard it uh, from now and again, but where our product intersects with that, I think is, is something that I need to tell you a little bit about. We, ex you know, current estimates have the world's population uh, growing by at least three more billion people by mid-century, by 2050. Um, food availability will not keep up with that with current practices. The world would need to, uh, at that time, in conjunction with that uh, population growth, will need to add one or double the production of, growth, uh, of, of food sorry, to, to sustain that population. And the agri-business agri uh, uh, you know, productivity must increase in order to support that. If, if you do not change the way that you cultivate right now, if you do not change the mindset, you will not be able to keep up, again, at least to, uh, according to the information that we have, you will not be able to keep up with that demand, or that growing demand and growing strains uh, on, on, on the population. Agriculture, as you know, is the largest consumer of, of uh, potable water in the world. Over 70% of uh, available water goes into agriculture. About 10% goes into uh, homes, consumer water. Uh, and of that, only 17%, 17% of the areas around the world are irrigated. That is, all the other parts are rain-fed. But of that 17%, they provide 40% of the global food production. So you can see why that is important, why irrigation is important. And then, and this is the most shocking figure of them all, 79%, or we like to say for brevity, 80% of the irrigated uh, portions of the world use flooding. I don't know who, you know who amongst you has seen what a flooded field looks like. A good example would probably be a rice paddy, but there are other examples along that. It's probably the most inefficient, probably the most onerous way that you can use water in order to irrigate a field. You basically open up the siphon, you know, open up the tap, and let the water run through the field. It's inefficient. It causes, uh, you know, runoff of the topsoil. Uh, you don't get enough water to the root. You basically <laughs> sort of uh, ir irrigate the topsoil and not the and not the root of the plant. 
the, the, as you can see, the, the proportion of penetration of drip irrigation is relatively low. It's about 4 to 5 percent, according to latest estimate around the world. Um, that is also that is that is uh, a handicap in one sense for us because it means that we're not selling enough or we're not as as you know as good in marketing as we should be. But is it is also as we like to point out, our major competitor is not number two in the drip irrigation sector. It's ignorance and the fact that people don't realize how they can change behaviors and modify their own usage of water and also improve their yields, which you'll see in a minute. So the 5% the, the, the figure is alarming in one sense, at least commercially wise, but it also represents an opportunity for consumers, which are farmers, but also for governments to improve. These figures, uh, again, I don't know uh, which of you has seen these figures in the past. They are uh, startling in the sense that you, you, you understand how much water it takes to manufacture stuff, stuff that we wear, stuff that we eat, things that we you know, don't think about. It takes over 4,000 liters of water to, uh, to make one pair of jeans. Can you realize that amount? because of the amount that needs to go into cotton. Cotton is very uh, intensive in terms of water usage, and so forth and so on. Uh, you also note the, the last line, which is beef, and, and that is an exorbitant amount. And you, we've all heard about the fact of changing tastes in, in, the, in, the, in the Far East in terms of more consumption of, of, raw me of, of, sorry, of red meat and so forth. That is a pressure that's going to keep on building up as, as we go along in the century. We've talked. We've already spoken a little bit about flood and far irrigation. As these are the examples, you know, best examples of flooding a field. Uh, it 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 causes depletion of water so resources because you use more water than you actually need to irrigate and cultivate the plant. Uh, you need more chemicals, more pesticides, more nutrients because they run off. Um, and 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 essentially this is this is an inefficient way to irrigate a field and one which is inconsistent with where we are in terms of the population and, and growth in the world. So the key issues and challenges that we're talking about and, and the intersection of these of these issues is, is very important for us. We're talking about food, fa fodder, fiber, and biofuel all competing for the same resources in the world, all competing for water, which is limited and growing limited, arable land, which is a finite resource, no matter how you turn it in the world, there's no more arable land that we can use right now. And there's, a, and there's, and there's a, you know, continuous pressure on that coming from our climate changes forces. Um, energy, which is, you know, if you look at it in and, and a historical perspective, is, is also rising. And then there are social and political uh, issues around poverty elevation and gender equality and urbanization. And all these are also pressuring you know, putting pressure, applying pressure on the agricultural sphere and, and the amount that it can produce. And drip irrigation historically, and this is perhaps the most significant line that I can, I can share with you, drip irrigation, if applied correctly, addresses, I wouldn't say solve because that would, you know, that would probably be too much of me to say, but it addresses, alleviates a lot of these concerns. If you apply it correctly, if you apply the right methodology around drip, then you alleviate a lot of these concerns. You use less water, less energy, and you produce more. I think uh, you, you heard a little bit about Netafim's, uh, sorry, Israel's, I'm confusing Israel and Netafim. I think that's, uh, that's good. Um, but you've heard a, bit, a little bit about Israel's solutions to the water scarcity issues about use of wastewater and use of brackish water and, and the efficient management use of, of water. I, I think I'll run through these. We also have a little bit amount of time. I, I want Nadi to talk about uh, the examples later on. So let me run through that. But you've heard about the reuse of uh, uh, wastewater in, in, in certain countries and the fact that Israel is leading the way in terms of having 80% of uh, uh, wastewater treated and, and reused. Um, and the obstacle to water use, I think you've, you've also heard from Alon. Um, again, these are issues that we are all dealing with. Israel is dealing with them, in, in, I think, in, in a sense that, that is helping the, the country's water management and helping us uh, you know, go, go through the, uh, the arid uh, uh, period that we're having. Um, let's talk about uh, subsurface drip irrigation a little bit. Generally speaking, drip, uh, drip irrigation can be applied either above surface or below surface. If you use it below surface, 
What you do is you reduce surface contamination because you don't throw into the ground or the topsoil, you don't throw nutrients or pesticides. It doesn't have contact with the fruit, reducing uh, the chances for disease because you irrigate, you drop water into the root of the plant without applying it to the ground or applying it to the fruit. Uh, obviously, wild animals or any, you know, any type of rodent would, wouldn't be able to drink the water or access the pipe. And, uh, and, and disposals of effluents are inside the ground and not on the topsoil. So these are uh, some of the attributes that you have on, on subsurface drip irrigation. Again, I, I'll, I'll jump through this because of, of lack of time. Uh, th these are the local treatment facilities we have in the south of Israel. Um, the camel photo is from Chatzirim, by the way. Not that we're growing camels in Chatzirim, but it is from there. Um, a little bit about uh, drip irrigation, which I've, which I've mentioned. So drip irrigation has the ability to optimize moisture and aeration conditions in the plant because you irrigate exactly the right amount, and ensures precise quantities of water and nutrients that come into the root zone, which you would see is a bulb-shaped uh, moisture zone around, around the, uh, around the uh, root, instead of having it above soil. Um, you uh, use precisely the right amount of uh, fertilizers, which are soluble in water, and you don't need to use more than you, uh, than you should. And you increase the yields by up to 50, 100%, depending on the practices, depending on the crop, depending on the area and the atmosphere and so forth. But you can boost, you can double your yield if you use it correctly. And what you'll see in Nati's uh, portion of the presentation is even when you have farmers in very underdeveloped uh, parts of the world, uh, sustenance, or hitherto sustenance farmers, you could, you could see that on average, we could increase between a quarter and a half of the, of the yield uh, of, of a given farmer. These are pipes on, on surface, and obviously these are subsurface. So the drippers, um, this is the product. As I told you, is, these are very small, as blown up here so you could, you could see them. What they do basically is they negotiate between the pipe and the root. So you would have, uh, if, you can, if you look at that, you, you see these small teeth. This is what we call the labyrinth. And the labyrinth, as we found out, has the characteristic of breaking the pressure of the water. And when you apply correct dimensions to the teeth, you could also regulate the output of uh, the dripper. So you'd know exactly how many drops per hour are emitted by the dripper into the plant, depending on the crop, obviously. There are other characteristics around the dripper which are uh, embedded inside. Namely, it has the capacity to throw back uh, dirt or other particles that may block it. And other types of drippers have the ability to compensate for pressure. So if you lay the pipe on a hilly area instead of a flat area, you could have the same output at the, at the bottom of the hill as you would have at the top of the hill by means of, of pressure compensation. So this is the, the wonderful story of the, uh, of the dripper. Uh, in, in the past decade or so, we've introduced low pressure systems. They are designed to deal with areas where energy is, is scarce, um, and therefore they utilize lower energy to, uh, uh, to uh, send out the water into the pipes. Uh, and uh, these are things that we're working on currently in terms of applying correct uh, management technologies around around the dripper system. These are electronic systems that we're selling also to our customers. Typically, you would not find them in the setting of an Indian or Chinese or African smaller farmer, but you do see them uh, in other parts of the world, where you could have systems that open and shut and and uh, correctly mix uh, you know nutrients and fertilizers inside, um, and also relay back. Uh, whether there are any issues uh, back to the back to the farmer, um, these are technologies that we are, you know, in a sense, pioneering, um, and we think that they're the next uh, you know the next frontier for for us in terms of how we uh, how we market our our systems and how they control uh, the devices. This is perhaps the family drip system is perhaps the ultimate example of what we do that I would say uh, goes directly to the heart. This is a system that we essentially pioneered about a decade or 15 years ago. I'm not sure of, of the exact time frame, Nati. But one that is specifically designed to address 
uh, farmers in, in difficult countries, farmers that are uh, sustenance farmers, farmers that have lack of access, do not have access to energy, um, and sometimes have, an, have an, a hard a task of locating water. So they're designed to have a small plot, uh, they're designed to cater for a small plot and, uh, and have a, a water barrel that is basically elevated. Water is poured into the barrel and then, and then sent out into the field into the dripper lines. Um, the advantages of using the family drip system are not limited only to agriculture. What you would see is a knock-on effect from co the correct application of the system and into the realms not only of agriculture but also sociological and even gender issues. And let me, let me, let me explain to you what, I'm, what, what I mean. First of all, when you have a system that, that increases your yield by 50 or 100 percent, you can raise, you can uplift the farmer from sustenance into commercial farming. That means the farmer would have uh, excess cash or excess liquidity to allow him to send you know, children to school, better living, better access to medicine, and so forth. The other, t the other thing that we've encountered, which was completely surprising to us, is there's also a gender issue around that. Because typically, in, in, in an Afri African agricultural setting, you would see the women going back and forth, shuttling back and forth between a well and the field, bringing water for about eight hours a day. With this system, you need half or less of the water. So unless you drill a hole, and by the way, we're also doing that, uh, unless you drill a borehole and, and take water out of that, uh, this system can at, at least reduce by half the amount of time that is required to bring the shuttle water back and forth between the well and the field. Uh, Netafim also, also does uh, greenhouses, which range from the very low end, which are tunnel products, up to the extreme high end of gr uh, greenhouses, which are small factories that are designed to basically buffer the cultivation of plants from the outside environment and their small manufacturing uh, facilities, um, uh, you know, complete with their own uh, high, you know, gas generation and water treatment and they produce yields that are uh, mind-boggling, and you can have them set up, and we've done that in, in countries like uh, Russia, in, in areas that are very, very cold, and they would produce tomatoes like you know, there were anywhere else. Um, these are the lower end uh, greenhouses, obviously, and, and, and they are deployed together with the drip irrigation system, so I've just exemplified the two ends of the systems. This one is uh, installed in Kenya. This is a project that we did um, in, in Gaza, actually, and this is you know, one of the areas that we're, we're very proud of in the sense that uh, use of, of correct water technology sees obviously no borders. Um, this is a small uh, you know, greenhouse uh, that we stole an, a, a large number of them through, uh, uh, through contacts in Gaza uh, with the aim of boosting and enhancing the yield of, of Palestinian farmers to supply local demand. Um, a very interesting project and one which we're, uh, we're proud of. And again, the, the case for Netafim is not only about technology, which is, as far as you know, we like to say, is, is, is on its own uh, spectacular, but also the fact that we, we, we do not leave our customers hanging out. We are, are, are with the, you know, without the knowledge of how to use the system, how to correctly apply the system. And this is one of the th this, these are one of our core beliefs. I'll let Nati talk a little bit about our uh, good practices and past uh, success. Hi, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, good practices. I, my name is Nati Barak. I'm a member of Kibbutz Chatzerim. I was privileged to be there when we started drip irrigation. At that time, I didn't want to join it. I didn't leave my middle-class family in the city and went as a pioneer to the Negev, to the desert, to become a plumber in plastic. And this was the way that I looked at it. And I said, no, I'll never join Etofim. It uh, didn't take much time, and I did join Etofim. And uh, I've been there since that time. Uh, Perhaps Ran gave a, a, a beautiful description of what Netafim is, and perhaps to uh, show you the reality uh, through uh, a few examples, what we say, uh, you know, good practices. 
So the first one is the Israeli Arava Desert, and again, I have a special place for the Arava as a young salesman at Netafim. This was my region. Of course, I was not salesman. This has a negative connotation to it. I was a field worker for Netafim. We never used the term uh, salesman. So when you drive from Be'er Sheva to Eilat and you look to the right, this is what you see. It's a beautiful picture. I love this area. When you look to the left at Moshav Ein Yahav in this case, it's the richest agricultural area in Israel. 65% of Israel's uh, vegetable export comes from the Arava. And this is a beautiful example of partnership because the Israeli government, through the extension service of the Ministry of Agriculture, did holy work and uh, an NGO, Jewish agency, JNF, you know, they collected donations and each farmer received a seed money. And then the private sector, which is not only us, it's also fertilizer, seed manufacturers and so on, and of course the farmers. And those partnerships in many places are the key to success. And another example for a nice partnership is India. We did a huge project in India, close to 200,000 farmers, small holders. The, the average farmer has perhaps three acres and various crops. And the, the, the state of Andhra Pradesh, which is the third largest state in India, they had a severe water uh, challenge and they were looking for a solution through drip irrigation and other efficient irrigation systems. Uh, through subsidies and, and very strict standards that they set for the irrigation companies that participated in the project. We did uh, this project and up to 70%, 50% if you move to sprinklers and 70% subsidy if you move to drip, uh, they finance this uh, project and these are the results. And when uh, Ran showed you the, the, the first slide was you can save uh, in the 70% that we are using for agriculture. Look at the savings. I mean, 50% uh, of the farmers saved up to 50% of the water. Another 20% of the farmers saved between 51 to 75% of the water. And look at the yield increase. And again, about 41% of the farmers had uh, increase in yield of up to 50% and so on. But then a professor from Ben Gurion University, a colleague of Alon, Professor Aviad Raz, went to do his own survey. And his survey was from the sociological point of view. And he came back to me and he said, Nati, as always, you are missing the point. You are constantly talking about uh, return on investment and increase in yield and savings in water and you don't see in front of your eyes what is happening to the society in those villages. Uh, he was a little bit carried away, so he said uh, from subsistence farmers, they became egg business entrepreneurs. So I don't know how much they are egg business entrepreneurs, but suddenly they became commercial farmers because they specialized in a certain crop and they bought together with the next door neighbor a, a motorized rickshaw and, and they became commercial farmers. And this is something incredible. And, and this is, I think, we are very fortunate being part of it. Kenya, Kitui, this was an NGO. Again, I have to remind myself that we are not an NGO. We are a for business company. I keep forgetting it, but fortunately we have a CEO that brings me back uh, to line. But many NGOs are doing work. But, but, but again, you know, our work, our business is doing well by doing good. We are doing good things and not make, I, I wanted to say making a fortune. We are not making a fortune, unfortunately. Uh, but we are doing very well. Kenya was an NGO thing. This was a social responsibility. An NGO from Italy bought 200 systems from our representative in Kenya and gave it to 200 poorest of the poor, mainly women, HIV, and, 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 and they are the one, the women that told us our life changed with drip irrigation because suddenly we can 
watch our children study and play and so on. So this is Kitui, Kenya, a beautiful brother. And, and again, you know, D Davide, this Italian guy in the picture, it's a one-man show. It was his idea, his drive, and, and it changed the life of uh, the village. Some people complain about this project. They say that we were involved in taking the best uh, opium producing land and turning it into uh, pomegranate and grapes and vegetables. So not everyone was happy with it. But the government of Afghanistan was very happy. And I'll tell you a secret. We cannot go into Afghanistan. Again, it's, it's post-conflict region. Uh, so, but, but we had to train them. Chamesh Dakot. Chamesh Dakot. No problem. <laughs> the, the secret is training, because capacity building comes only with training. And in Afghanistan, we, didn't, we couldn't go into Afghanistan, so we had the seminar, a six-week seminar in Thailand, bringing the Afghans and, and doing this beautiful project. Another buzzword, south to south. From our South African manufacturing facility, we did this huge project of sugar cane in uh, uh, Swaziland. Very successful. And again, of course, increase in yield, savings in water, and so on. Uh, but the nice thing is that it was all done in Africa with some help of our agronomists. And, and there's another thing that I want to tell you, perhaps being kibbutzniks and farmers, it's very easy to go to a farmer and say, listen, we invented drip irrigation. Listen to us. Follow what we say. This is the wrong attitude. We go as a farmer talking to a farmer. You have been growing lettuce in China for three generations. You must know something about growing lettuce. And we know something about drip irrigation, so let's combine our knowledge. And this is a beautiful approach, I think. So Ecuador, it's very simple, uh, very similar to what we did in, in Kenya, again, 700, no, 700 is the years, uh, 850 units that were installed there with poor families with excellent and beautiful results. Uh, I think that this is the last one, I'm not sure. Bedouins at Wadi Atir. The, the township of Khura, they have an excellent mayor, Muhammad El Nabari. He is a real entrepreneur. He left his job, he has PhD in chemistry, left his job with one of the Perigo, one of the pharmaceutical manufacturers in the southern part of Israel to become the mayor of Khura. And he came to us and together we are, we are doing this project. It's going to change lives of people, uh, uh, I believe, over there. West Bank, for us it's business. I mean, we are not involved in politics. For us, selling drip irrigation in West Bank and in Gaza, it's, it's a daily routine. We have a salesman that goes there and talks to the people, and they talk to him, and they know a lot about drip irrigation because you know, they've been working with us in the old days of the Israeli empire in the Katif region and so on. So they've been working in the fields, learning about drip irrigation. Some of them perhaps know about drip irrigation today more than I will ever know. So uh, I don't remember who said it. I think Alon said it earlier. Drip irrigation and water and the Israeli solutions are bridgehead for peace in the region. So there is a summary, and I guess that uh, your reading uh, uh, capabilities in English are much better than my accent. So just read it and believe it. It's true because I wrote it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much to uh, to Nati and Ran. Um, we must uh, close this at uh, three o'clock, but we do have some time for questions. If there are some questions for either Nati or for Ran, yes, please. Okay. Uh, what are you doing in China? Uh, we are trying to sell drip irrigation, <laughs> basically. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in China. We feel that it's changing now. Uh, China is not a big success for us. India is. There's competing, India and the United States are competing for being the number one subsidiary of medicine. So India is a big success. China, 
we are still making the first steps which we started uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> can, can I add to that, uh, just uh, if, if I may? I think China and India are perhaps the best examples of countries where supposedly this should have been you know, developed you know, in the same fashion. But you, the difference, the key difference between India and China is the attitude of the government. Whereas in India, they put in place a very comprehensive, very transparent, and very efficient subsidy program to deal directly with the farmers in need. They haven't done so in China. And those programs have really done marvelous things. And Nati has given you one example in Andhra Pradesh. There are fine examples in Gujarat and Tamil Nadu and other states in India that have done the same. And, and this is the reason for the divergent responses of the market. Thank you. Yes, do I have another question, please? Uh, over there in the, in the back. Joe Greenblatt from the EPA. What do you think are the biggest barriers to uh, sales and, and growth of the uh, drip irrigation export? And if it's finance, or even if it's not, have you employed any innovative finance mechanisms to help, uh, help your sales? Ran will talk about finance. I'll talk about ignorance. Awareness, I'll put it in a positive way. Awareness to what we can do and the answers that we Nothing give to the microphone. real challenges uh, is important. And uh, where uh, decision makers and leaders are aware of this, like India, like Turkey in some cases, like Israel, of course, then drip irrigation uh, uh, succeeds. Uh, financing is a challenge, and perhaps Ron can say a word about it. Sorry about the tag team, by the way. Um, financing is always an issue, especially uh, with farmers that are um, you know, in need of, of, of finance, in need of the ab or access to CapEx, to capital expenditures. Um, and we, we are trying to introduce innovative financing solutions. We are trying to work with the international community, the World Bank, the IFC, and other organizations, as, as well as a number of NGOs to help bridge that gap. There is also a knowledge gap in terms of the, the financiers of what this technology can do. So on its own, when, when a poor farmer would turn to his bank and say, hey, listen, I want a loan. I don't have a balance sheet, and I, I'm not really making money, but I want a loan to buy a bit of plastic, it does sound to, you know, a bit suspicious on the part of the bank. Obviously, I'm oversimplifying the thing. There is a chasm to be bridged. We're trying to bridge it. It takes a lot of time. 